Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this fall 2012 President's Convocation. We're pleased that you're here. Uh, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to introduce our special guest, Dr. John Neuenschwander. Uh, Dr. Neuenschwander went to school in Ohio, undergraduate work at Mount Union College, took an MA in history at the University of Vermont. From there, he went to Case Western University in Ohio, where he took a PhD in history. Uh, I met John uh, when he and I participated together in a year-long postdoc program at Johns Hopkins. He, the uh, historian, and uh, I, the anthropologist, and uh, we have maintained a friendship ever since. But John uh, left that experience at Hopkins, went back home, and went to uh, law school in Chicago at Kent School of Law. Uh, all the same time, while he was teaching full-time history as a history professor uh, at Carthage University in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Uh, to me, an amazing feat to be able to teach full-time and still complete a law degree in three years. Uh, he went on to become an expert in oral history, and again, given his legal background, uh, oral history and the law has made him kind of the specialist uh, around the country on that particular topic. Uh, at the same time, uh, while he was professor, for a number of years he served as a municipal judge in, uh, in Kenosha, elected to that position on a number of occasions, uh, and again, bringing a very special perspective as a historian and a lawyer uh, to the judgeship. Uh, a lot of interesting cases and, and some rather humorous ones. I, my, my favorite case that John talks about is one that actually made international news. Uh, he had a young man come before him and uh, the guy was convicted of driving under the influence and John sentenced him to jail and the guy pulled out a Monopoly get out of jail card and gave it to him uh, with the assumption that this was gonna allow him to avoid the sentence. But uh, for somehow that got picked up by the press and uh, I read about it somewhere. I think I was in Tennessee at the time. But uh, John has had an interesting career, brings something special to his profess profession as a historian. And so without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Neuenschwander. Good morning. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. And I would like to especially thank those of you who actually volunteered to come here this morning. As a judge for 25 years, I spoke every morning to non-volunteer audiences, so it's always a thrill when someone actually makes a choice to come and listen to me rather than being brought in in shackles or some other circumstance. As for those students who are here under some duress, perhaps because you need to fill a credit or a professor told you to come here, uh, I will try to be interesting, and at the very least, I will not be long-winded. So let's begin. I'm going to talk about uh, oral history in the 21st century. And to do that, I'm going to start with the origins of oral history, uh, the pre-modern and modern forms of it, uh, talk about uh, what oral history really is, and then uh, take you through a case study. And the case study, we'll get this uh, so we're not getting mic feedback here, involves one of uh, George's uh, most famous native sons, Dean Rusk. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the ethical and legal dimensions involved. Uh, I could have done that entirely, but I think it's uh, sometimes a little boring and certainly uh, hard to follow. So we will, uh, we will focus on what I've suggested. So let's begin. Uh, Pre-modern oral history goes back a long way, and I could come up with any number of examples, but I will start with the Greek historian Thucydides, uh, who wrote a history of the Peloponnesian Wars back in the 5th century BC. Uh, he was a very unique historian in the sense that uh, at that time most historians uh, talked about cause and effect in terms of what the gods had willed to happen. He didn't uh, take that approach. He looked at what human actions uh, involved. And he was uh, very intent upon uh, finding out about the war between Sparta and Greece by interviewing eyewitness uh, participants on both sides. So he went around and interviewed these individuals and collected their stories and put them into his histories. Now, he offers us a cautionary word that I will uh, continue to use as a thread through my remarks this morning. Uh, 
Uh, he said, well, sometimes these eyewitnesses give different accounts of the same events, and that comes from either their partiality to one side or the other, or because they have imperfect memories. So that like, kind of has a modern ring to it, as we'll see as we go forward. A second example of pre-modern oral history is right before the American Revolution. A congregational minister by the name of William Gordon, right after Lexington and Concord, interviewed Paul Revere and other Sons of Liberty to find out what really happened before uh, that event that uh, basically triggered the American Revolution. Uh, his accounts have later been praised by uh, historians today as being quite accurate in terms of what he was able to gather. Another example is uh, in 1865, shortly after the tragic assassination of Abraham Lincoln, two of his personal secretaries, John Nicolay and John Hay, decided that they were going to produce a biography of the, uh, the man they revered so much. So they went around and began interviewing individuals who were, had worked with Lincoln. They were very disappointed because uh, they didn't like what people were telling them. People were telling them about some of the personal problems Lincoln had, bouts with depression, marital difficulties, and they didn't want to hear that. So their uh, account of the oral histories they had is that they were worthless to history. The last uh, example of pre-modern oral history occurred during the 1930s, and it uh, was the result of the so-called Federal, Federal Writers Project. Because of the Great Depression and the ec economic dislocation, the decision was made to put a lot of writers back to work uh, and one of the ways they put them back to work was sending them out across the United States to interview individuals about everyday life. And in the South particularly, particularly in Florida and Georgia, some of the interviewers began to focus on former slaves. Remember, this is the 1930s. Uh, slavery ended in 1865, and so a lot of these folks were quite elderly. So they began interviewing in all of the former Confederate states, the, uh, the number of uh, former slaves they could in, uh, find and, and round up and interview, and they did, and the result was the so-called slave narratives. Uh, 2,300 interviews uh, talking about the experiences in slavery. It's now at the Library of Congress. Now, why are these pre-modern examples of oral history? Someone is out there interviewing. Well, the problem was there were no recorders. To do this, uh, you had to take notes. And just as you this morning might uh, perhaps have to take notes, you could not unless you have, uh, like a court reporter can take everything down, you can only take down certain things. So you select, and you select consciously and subconsciously. So there's never a complete record of what the uh, interviewer tells you, or the interviewee tells you, excuse me. Secondly, uh, many of these uh, early projects were designed to collect information, to write a book, uh, to produce something immediately. As we'll see with modern oral history, the idea is to collect for the future. The questions you ask are not questions designed only to help you write your book or do your article, but to allow other researchers to come along and perhaps find valuable information. So there's a broader perspective. The transition point, uh, as I see it, to uh, modern history, modern oral history, occurred during World War II. Uh, a, a lieutenant colonel who was the head of the Army Division uh, relative to history decided to send uh, historians with the, these huge wire uh, tape recorders out into the battlefields and immediately after combat sit down with officers and enlisted men and try to get an account of exactly what happened. And so these recordings were done. And this is the transition because we're using recorders and the idea is beginning to appear that we're going to collect this material for future researchers not for immediate use. So moving forward to, uh, actually moving from pre-modern to modern as we go forward, uh, the individual that we generally look to as the father of modern oral history was a historian biographer by the name of Alan Nevins. He was at Columbia University and he was well noted for his writings. Uh, he had written extensively about the Civil War and he had written biographies of President Grover Cleveland and Henry Ford and John D. Rockefeller. In doing so, he uh, relied heavily on their correspondence, and he also did some informal interviewing. But uh, sitting in the late 1940s in uh, New York City, as he read the New York Times every morning, he read the obituaries, and he would mark off another prominent individual who had gone off to the, uh, the great beyond and taken with uh, him or her their memories of the past. And with the advent of the telephone, early technology, he realized people weren't writing letters anymore. 
So as he thought of future biographers, he said, what will they write from? Where will be their sources? So he decided to set up an oral history program. So he brings together the idea of preserving uh, oral history for the future, collecting it, and obviously doing so with a recorder. And so beginning in 1948, the Columbia program, which is still one of the major programs today in the United States, begins collecting oral histories. Now they do so with the individuals that I will call the elites. These are prominent individuals from government and business, and that's the uh, population that uh, was focused upon. Uh, beginning in the 1960s and early 1970s, there were certain changes in the way historians were approaching their discipline. If you were a graduate student in the mid-1960s to late 1960s, perhaps early 1970s, instead of your major professor suggesting uh, an elite individual to write a biography of or to write about a particularly significant national or even regional event, uh, more and more emphasis was beginning on writing history from the bottom up, going to the grassroots, trying to figure out uh, what certain groups had been involved in, whether it be uh, racial minorities, ethnic minorities, whatever they were, that didn't particularly have a voice. And so that began in the 60s and 70s. The process was greatly aided by the writings of a gentleman by the name of Studs Terkel, a radio journalist uh, from Chicago who uh, pro provided such classics as um, the uh, working on the whole idea of working, hard times on the Great Depression, and the good war on World War II. And it was also in 1976 that Alexander Haley published Roots that provided another example of how you, needed, you could and do uh, grassroots history from the bottom up. So we see this transition. Uh, it was not always an easy transition. Uh, I had a friend who was a um, oral historian for the U.S. Marine Corps, and uh, I asked him one time, I said, uh, now are you going to start uh, uh, interviewing individuals who are enlisted in the Marine Corps? And he kind of looked at me and smiled and he said, no, I only interview generals. So some people couldn't move from the elite to the non-elite interviewing. Now, we have today in Georgia, if you uh, go onto your computer and look at the Digital Library of Georgia, uh, which has the uh, subtitle, Sharing Georgia's History and Culture Online, here are some of the collections that you could access that give you an example of both elite and non-elite oral history right in your state here. The Georgia Political Heritage Program, which would obviously be an elite program. The Georgia Women's Movement. Uh, you've got the Mill Workers Oral Histories. You've got the Oral Histories of the American South in collaboration with other programs. And then you have Georgia Tech, telling it like it was 1915 on Atlanta and campus life. So right here in Georgia, you have the mixture of elite and non-elite oral history programs. And it gives you an idea of uh, where oral history is today. Now, what I'd like to do is talk about uh, a couple of giant national programs that re reflect the grassroots non-elite approach to oral history. The first one is called the Veterans History Program, and it is located at the Library of Congress. It was uh, begun in year 2000, and the focus was to try to record the stories of the uh, individuals who had served in America's wars in the 20th century and into the 21st century. It is totally based on the use of volunteer interviewers. In fact, some of you out here in this audience may have participated in the program. When I was teaching at Carthage College, I occasionally would have students and I would assign them a, a task of doing an interview for this program. Basically, you go online, there's a kit that explains the whole process of doing oral history, has all the necessary legal forms, and explains how you submit this to the Library of Congress for uh, permanent uh, storage there. And as of this date, I believe, I called them recently, there's 80,000 uh, interviews with not only military personnel, but also those who supported them, and the project is ongoing. So at this very moment, I'm sure uh, an interview somewhere is going forward with a a veteran of uh, Desert Storm or the Iraq War or any of the other wars. Um, this brings me to what I'd like to show you. Uh, it's a video clip from a veteran of uh, D-Day, and it comes from a program uh, right outside of Atlanta called Witness to War, which is doing the same thing as the Veterans History Program, but it's doing it in a way that it's uh, more localized down here in Georgia. And the clip I'm going to show you as we get to uh, that place is of a gentleman by the name of Carl Beck. And Carl Beck was with the 101st Airborne Division, or the so-called Screaming Eagles. Uh, 
It was a paratrooper division, and uh, his division's role and two other divisions uh, before D-Day, actually in the early morning hours before the uh, beaches landing occurred, was to be dropped into France uh, behind enemy lines and to secure bridges and destroy other bridges and to try to prevent any counterattack on the beaches that the German forces might launch once they discovered where D-Day was going to occur. Well, as he will indicate in this interview, uh, there were troubles from the, the beginning. Uh, there was pilot air uh, dropping them in the wrong area. There was also pilot air in terms of dropping in at too low an altitude, so many were uh, killed and injured. And the end result was that all three of these paratrooper divisions uh, that were dropped behind enemy lines were in a totally confused, discombobulated state. And the best way I can present this to you is those of you who have seen the movie Saving Private Ryan. Uh, the movie uh, is about a fictitious uh, private, uh, and he was a member, as they set it up in the movie, of the 101st Airborne Division. And if you recall from the movie, it takes a long time for Tom Hanks and his unit to find Private Ryan because of what had happened, in other words, historically true, what had happened on the Normandy landing. So let's listen to Carl Beck, and it'll give you a flavor of what an actual oral history interview was like. And so we'll go forward with this, with my directions. Well, you understand the planes were uh, took off from Walford Park, and it, if you look at uh, the old-timey films of the planes taking off, uh, we were in double daylight saving time, and it was around 11 o'clock at night. And in those latitudes, uh, you only have four or five hours of darkness, so that by 11 o'clock at night, you can see well enough to take uh, photographs. So it was pretty pretty good light when we loaded the airplanes, and there were uh, 14 of us in the C-47. And back in those days, it took nine uh, airplanes to haul a company, and the planes flew in a V of Vs of nine planes with a Vs, a V, and a V. And the lead plane had what we called the Rebecca, which was a receiving device from the uh, pathfinders who were on the ground. Well, as we flew out over the channel, we dodged uh, generally southbound and kind of fish hooked around and came back in a nearly northerly direction uh, so the planes could go back to England and pick up the gliders and the support troops for the next day. Well, as we hit the Cotentin Peninsula, by the way, I remind people that uh, that's the Cotentin Peninsula. That most people say it's the Normandy Peninsula. It, Normandy is a, is a province of France. But the Cotentin Peninsula, uh, we approached it generally from a southerly, uh, we were flying generally northbound. And uh, as we hit the coast, we hit ground uh, uh, cloud cover. And back in those days, they didn't have the proximity business that they have in airplanes now. So the formation began to deteriorate. When we came out of the clouds, we hit 20 millimeter fire. 20 millimeter anti-aircraft fire is, uh, is beautiful. It's uh, uh, like the 4th of July in pyrotechnics, but it'll kill you. And our airplane got hit. And I tell people that if you're ever in an airplane that gets hit, it sounds like your head's in a bucket and somebody's pounding on the bucket. Well, of course, our technique called for us to get a uh, red light. 20 minutes later, get a green light. Well, but in that 20-minute period, you're supposed to stand up, hook up, check your equipment, get the bundle ready to door, kick it out and so forth, and get all lined up. You understand that airplane rocking and rolling. And uh, between, we didn't get the 20-minute 20, 20 period. We got a bell, which means get out of this airplane. So we all got out. I'm sad to say I don't know what happened to the plane and crew, but all of our people got out. And by this time, we had passed the 20-millimeter fire as far as we were concerned, and the beautiful moon shining. So when I left the airplane, my uh, my assistant gunner, by the way, got uh, ahead of me, and he was real good at this, by the way. I hooked up before me and went out before the bundle. And you understand that was my 18th jump. And uh, I was always, always first on that bundle. You know, you know get that machine gun out and get, get, get going. And we had a little double-headed blue flashlight 
on the bundle. And when it hit the prop blast, it, it activated. And when I got my opening shock, check my canopy. You check your canopy for blown panels. Check my canopy, turn my head, and I saw the bundle hit the ground. And, of course, at around 800 feet actual above ground altitude, it doesn't take long to get on the ground. But when I landed, my parachute went over a hedge. The hedgerows in Normandy had trees growing out of the top. And so that was, you know, at the top of that tree was 30, 35 feet off the ground. My canopy went over these trees, and that meant that I was kind of swinging with my fanny about that far off the ground. And uh, I pulled out my jump knife. We didn't have the quick releases like we had in Holland. So I cut my way out of the parachute. And, uh, of course, I went to find that bundle. And I haven't seen that bundle since. <laughs> and uh, uh, it was just uh, such a disorienting uh, uh, occasion that uh, you, just, you just sort of, well, literally lost, you know. So uh, that was uh, the landing and all that went re real smooth. Okay, there you have, uh, I think, an excellent video clip uh, that shows you the power of oral history. Uh, obviously an outstanding uh, narrator, and it, uh, so it kind of takes you back, sort of you feel like you have a window to history. And obviously not all interviews are as dramatic or as uh, kind of gets you involved, but I think it does, uh, does give you an idea. Well, let me talk about one other giant national grassroots program, and it's known, uh, known by the name StoryCorps. In StoryCorps, those of you who listen to National Public Radio in the morning, the morning edition, they play audio clips from the StoryCorps program uh, all the time. Uh, this is another volunteer program, and it has a little different focus than the Veterans History program. Uh, the focus seems to be much more on gathering the stories of everyone. Uh, as, they, as they indicate in their literature, to provide Americans of all backgrounds and beliefs with the opportunity to record, share, and preserve the stories of our lives. Uh, StoryCorps interviews uh, are at the Library of Congress also at the American Folklife Center. And uh, as they again remind us, these stories uh, talk about our shared humanity, uh, builds connections between people, teaches the value of listening, and that everyone matters. So you have uh, elite and non-elite uh, history. Um, but what is oral history as I move to my next topic? In other words, uh, We've had a, an interview clip. I've talked to you about pre-modern and modern examples, but what really is it? Well, let me lead, read you a definition from the um, Oral History Association, which is the national organization for, of oral historians and programs, which, by the way, will uh, come January be based right here in Georgia at Georgia State University. Uh, that's where the executive secretary in the office will be located uh, beginning, as I indicated, in January. Uh, this is their definition of oral history. Oral history begins with an audio or video recording of a first-person account made by an interviewer with an interviewee, also referred to as a narrator, both of whom have conscious intention of creating a permanent record to contribute to an understanding of the past. A verbal document, you just saw a verbal document. The oral history results from the process and is preserved and made available in different forms to other users researchers, and the public. A critical approach to the oral testimony interpretations are necessary in the use of oral history. Uh, I'm not ask, going to ask you to write that down or think about it. I'm going to give you a shorter definition that hopefully will take us through the remainder of my presentation. Oral history is simply the creation, recording, and preservation of verbal documents to enhance the historical record creation, recording, and preservation of verbal documents to enhance the historical record. Uh, how good a source is it? In other words, you've heard from uh, Thucydides, who had some doubts about uh, long-term memory. And uh, there's a lot of studies on long-term memory and how it can change over time. And some people have had real doubts about that. You had uh, Lincoln's two secretaries, Nicolay and Hay, not being very happy with the oral histories they received because in part they didn't go along the way they wanted them to go. And you've had other accounts indicating that it's uh, quite reliable. Well, the message I can give to you is quite simple. You treat it like you would treat any other historical source. You uh, take a critical view of it. You determine its reliability. You determine uh, whether you can verify and corroborate it. And once you do all of the sort of internal critical checks that you would do in normal research, 
you do it with written documents, and you do it with verbal documents. So it's not something that you have to take out and do anything different, but what you do have to avoid is uh, becoming what I would call anti-historical. In other words, listening to Carl Beck or someone that has his ability to remember in great detail and to provide the sense of the vividness of that moment, we almost can lose sight of the fact that this is not the final word. This is only one source and it may have a particular orientation. So we have to step back and not be anti-historical when dealing with oral history. Uh, now I wanna move to a case study. And this is uh, on one of uh, George's uh, most uh, famous uh, individuals, Dean Rusk. Uh, Dean Rusk, for those who are not familiar with his life and career, uh, was Secretary of State from 1961 to 1969. So he served both in the Kennedy administrations and in the Johnson administrations. He's the second longest serving Secretary of State in American history. Uh, when he left Washington in 1969, he promised everyone he would never write his memoir. As those of you who uh, are in the uh, area of history or political science know that most uh, prominent public figures do write their memoirs. All presidents write their memoirs and many others write their memoirs. He promised he would never do this. He said he would never do it because he uh, believed that uh, the people he had been surrounded by during his career had showed him that it was not a, a useful exercise, and if to do it, he had to be as honest as possible, he would harm the reputations of too many people. So he leaves in 1969, and he basically moves into what might be called a rather private life. He comes back to Georgia, takes a professorship uh, at the law school at the University of Georgia, professor of international law, and not much more is heard of Dean Rusk. He was not like Henry Kissinger, who became a uh, media figure for many, many years after his uh, stints as Secretary of State. So let's look a little bit at Rusk's background, just to get you into uh, some material here that might help you. Uh, born in Cherokee County, Georgia in 1909 in what most his historians and biographers believe was genteel poverty. Um, stories are told, and if we view uh, most of them as basically true, um, for underwear, he had uh, underwear made out of gunny sacks. They threw rocks at passing trains in hopes the train men would throw chunks of coal off the train to help the family. And uh, they had situations where um, the uh, calcium depleted diet that he uh, grew up with led to uh, tremendous problems later life with, uh, with his teeth. Uh, he managed to overcome this. Uh, move, the family moved to Atlanta, went through Atlanta public schools and um, then went on to the poor man's Princeton uh, in New North Carolina Davidson College where he graduated Phi, Phi Beta Kappa. From there, he became a Rhodes Scholar, went to Oxford, eventually taught in California, and while he was there, managed also to pick up a law degree along the way. And during the late 1940s, was one of the rising stars of the State Department, uh, projected on, in the Truman Administration to be a future Secretary of State. Well, he uh, changed career path at that time and decided he wanted to leave uh, government service and so he became the head of the Rockefeller Foundation throughout the 1950s. And then in 1960, with the election of John F. Kennedy, the president, uh, he was tapped to be the Secretary of State. Many people were surprised by the choice. It wasn't one of those where the media was out front saying this individual or this individual is going to be selected. So he comes on as Secretary of State in 1961. And this led to a uh, dramatic, dramatic shift at home, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And if it were not for modern oral history and his relationship with his son, I probably wouldn't even be talking about Dean Rusk this morning. Because what happened basically is his son Richard, who was born in 1946, lost a connection basically with his father during the period of the time he was Secretary of State. And in other words, uh, they had situations like during that period when he was in high school, his father would come home on an average uh, one night a month for dinner because of the demands of the responsibilities of Secretary of State. They were also divided by the Vietnam War. Uh, Richard was basically opposed to the war, although he did it privately in deference to his father. And so they were split because Dean Rusk was considered one of the ma major advocates of our participation in the Vietnam War. So their relationship basically deteriorated to the point where there was almost no relationship. And then uh, in 1984, uh, Richard Rusk is living in Alaska and he decides that uh, he has to try to do something to repair the relationship with his father. 
So he moves his family back to Georgia and he goes to his father's house. And as he said, uh, he not walked up on the door and I'm sure it's not the exactly way it happened, but he walked up, told his dad, we're going to write a book, Pop. And they began recording oral histories. And they recorded oral histories to cover the 80 years of Dean Rusk's life. First, it was a little slow. Dean Rusk was a little reluctant to share too much, but eventually they warmed to the task. And the end result is uh, the book you see up there, a case study, as I saw it. The memoir that Dean Rusk said he would never write was written because of modern oral history and the decision of his son to, uh, to work with it. So I'd like to talk about this book in the context of a case study for two reasons. One, the creation of verbal documents or a document by the memoir and the ability of oral history to bring people together, the humanizing dimension of oral history. And first I'll talk about the verbal document. Uh, when this process was going forward, the general perception of Dean Rusk that was kind of out there was that he had not been a very effective Secretary of State. It was kind of dull, kind of quiet, and um, he was not considered to have been very exceptional. A great deal of this interpretation was the result of a work uh, of someone else in the Kennedy administration, a historian by the name of Arthur M. Schlesinger, Jr. Arthur M. Schlesinger, Jr. was, historically speaking, the first historian in residence in a White House. John F. Kennedy brought him on board in, uh, in 1961 to basically uh, roam around the White House, go to meetings, and eventually sort of uh, keep track of the history of the administration. Uh, in doing so, he would attend meetings, take notes, make observations, and what have you. And the observations he made about Dean Rusk were as follows. Uh, and he published this in his Pulitzer Prize winning book, A Thousand Days, which was written immediately after the uh, tragic assassination of John F. Kennedy and is considered to be one of the better books about uh, looking at inside the administration. But he characterized Rusk as sitting in meetings and he said rather Buddha-like, and you can see that uh, he has a hairstyle similar to mine, that you could be Buddha-like, um, with a half smile on his face and saying, Nothing, or if he did say anything, it would only be glib generalities. And so others picked up on this. And this idea that Rusk was not up to the task and didn't really participate and was not an effective member of the foreign policy team of the Kennedy administration sort of carried on. So in the memoir, Rusk has an opportunity to respond. He has a chance to offer in his verbal document his own view of things. And if you uh, are curious, you want to pick up the book, there are several sections about Schlesinger, and he basically said he didn't trust Schlesinger. He felt that he was always running around looking to pick up little uh, bits of information and share them with the press or do something, and he was sort of like a, uh, a leak waiting to happen. And so whenever he was in a meeting with Rusk and a, a number of other people, uh, or excuse me, with uh, Schlesinger, uh, Rusk always took the position uh, being quiet and saying little was the best procedure. And then he lets us in on something else. Uh, the National Security Council was a very important policy-making uh, branch during that period and still is today. And Rusk indicated that uh, while Schlesinger was able to sit in on the larger National Security Council meeting, he was never invited to the Tuesday luncheons. And he said it was at the Tuesday luncheons that most of the decisions were made. There was a free discussion. No one was worried about uh, what they said being told out of, out of doors. And uh, this is where he did most of his work. And so when it came to the National Security Council, he didn't have to say much. There wasn't much to be said, and he didn't trust Schlesinger. So we get a verbal document from Rusk countering uh, the account by uh, Schlesinger. And uh, we can use this in the context of our research and say, well, let's look at other sources, both written and oral, and see how it stands up. And I think uh, other biographies have said it stands up very well. So what about the uh, human side of it? Well, let me le read you just a short portion of the afterword that uh, Richard Rusk wrote to tell you what this meant to him to uh, reconnect with his father. He said, arriving in Georgia in 1948, uh, 1984, excuse me, for our father-son journey, I carried with me some ambivalent feelings. I would have waited longer, but Pop's health was failing. I had grown up his son, lived in his house, yet remained a stranger. Are some ghosts better left undisturbed? What was the truth about my father? What followed was an awkward, sometimes difficult, always fascinating journey. 
Reflecting on that complex leg legacy, having seen the whole man and not just chapters of his life, I found for myself that elusive inner peace. Dean Rusk can be a very stubborn man. Yes, there is a mystery to my father's life, given his inscrutability. But wherever he is buried, for me at least, there will be no mystery in that coffin, no corroding doubt. I think that gives you a, a wonderful sense of what this meant to Richard to undertake this, uh, this whole process. Well, let's move on, and I'll try to gently take you through the last uh, phases of this. Whenever you do oral history, whether it be for the Veterans History Project uh, or any other grassroots project or elite project, there are always ethical and legal issues. Uh, the Oral History Association, uh, which I've already mentioned to you, has a code of ethics, the so-called principles and best practices, and they want uh, interviewers and programs to uh, follow these ethics to the best of their ability. The most important considerations in these ethics are what I would call fair dealing and transparency with the narrator with the interviewee, making sure they know exactly what you're doing, why you're doing it, uh, allowing them to do uh, something that many uh, interviewees do, and that's, I don't want to talk about the subject. If we think of Carl Beck here, there may have been some place in the interview where if someone asked him a question, he said, I don't want to talk about that, it's too painful. You have to respect that, and sometimes they don't want to go further in detail on other things, you have to respect that the ability to withdraw at any time if they decide this is uncomfortable, <clears throat> and then clearly telling them what's going to be done with their interview. That's a really important thing today because years ago the interview would be recorded, placed in an archive, and the only way you could access this would be to come to the archive and access it directly. Now, of course, uh, we're in the dig digital rev revolution <clears throat> and virtually everything is available online. So people need to know this uh, before you go forward with that. Uh, the second is ethical issue is simply to run a sound historical program that you uh, use good interviewing procedures and you preserve materials in the most effective and uh, positive way. What about the legal issues? Uh, I could spend uh, another hour on this, but I promised you I'd not be long-winded, so we will get you to lunch on time. Uh, I'd like to divide it up into three areas. Uh, there are many more legal issues and they seem to be popping up every day as I uh, try to keep track of this. Um, but basically, uh, I always start <clears throat> excuse me, with the idea that you, if you have a, song, a strong ethical foundation in your program, uh, then the legal preparation and the legal prevention aspect will come very easily. Uh, first issue <clears throat> excuse me, is the legal uh, release agreement. Uh, no oral history program today, uh, internationally or in the United States, is really doing any work without a legal release agreement. You have to get the individual to sign this agreement to indicate that they're voluntarily participating, that they want their interview or interviews to go to the program, and that they understand that they are signing away, if, they, if you get that, the copyright to the interviews, and they also need to know the future uses that will be made of this, and that needs to be all laid out. And as I'll mention briefly, there are unfortunately thousands of interviews uh, scattered around the country, and I'm sure many here in Georgia, that were conducted back in the 1960s, 70s, and uh, early 80s without legal release agreements. And the holders of these agreements, uh, excuse me, of these uh, interviews are not willing to let them available to the public because of the fear of uh, legal issues cropping up, particularly copyright. Second area of concern, defamation and privacy. No, you cannot defame the dead, but a narrator can defame the living. And if that happens and it gets out and someone files a lawsuit, uh, the old adage that uh, tail uh, bearers are as bad as tail makers fits here because if you publish a book and someone feels it's defamatory, you as the author will be on the, uh, the lawsuit, the publisher will be on the lawsuit, and the interviewee who gave you the story will be on the lawsuit. So you can kind of cover all of that. Uh, another area that comes in is copyright. Oral histories are considered to be creative works and can be copyrighted and are copyrighted. And so this always comes in and to transfer copyright you have to have a written release, although oral releases are acceptable under certain circumstances, but you're really looking at a written release. Let me talk about, in finishing up here, the most famous case involving oral history uh, to this date, and it's very current, and it's one that uh, 
If you remember nothing from this lecture, you may pick up a newspaper sometime and see that the United States Supreme Court has taken this case because we're right in that deciding zone. It may or may not be taken up by the Supreme Court in the next month or so. Uh, it's the Boston College case, and this is how this case evolved without too much deep background. During the uh, 1970s and 1980s, uh, there was a great deal of violence in Northern Ireland and in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, the uh, Catholic factions in Northern Ireland were uh, basically contending with the Protestant factions in Northern Ireland, and both groups had uh, paramilitary groups. The uh, paramilitary group for the Catholics was known as the Irish Republican Army or the IRA. To give you an idea of the extent of the violence, uh, over 3,500 individuals died in the violence, everything from uh, straight out assassinations to car bombings to arson uh, to kidnappings and disappearances. Finally ended in 1998 when an accord was reached, the uh, Good Friday Accord. And in 2000, uh, a couple of researchers at Boston College uh, decided that it would be a good idea to see what was really going on in this civil war, uh, not a declared civil war. So they set up an oral history program and they contacted a number of former paramilitary members, mostly members of the IRA, but some members of the Protestant uh, paramilitaries. They sat them down and they said, if you give us an interview and tell us exactly what you were doing with as much candor as you possibly can, we will guarantee you absolute confidentiality. No one will ever be able to look at your interview uh, unless you allow them to, and they will not be opened until after your death. The program went forward. Over the course of uh, about 10 years, they collected uh, with 26 individuals, hundreds and hundreds of hours of uh, recording. And then in uh, 2010, um, one of the interviewees, the narrators, went back to Ireland and spoke to a couple of Irish newspapers and kind of hinted that in this Belfast project collection, there was a lot of material about unsolved crimes during the Troubles. Well, uh, somebody obviously in the police service over there picked this up and uh, contacted the authorities in the United Kingdom and they have a, a mutual legal assistance treaty with the United States, who then contacted the U.S. Attorney General's office, and they issued a subpoena for one set of interviews. That subpoena now has morphed into several subpoenas for other interviews. So the basic issue is, uh, is the Pledge of Confidentiality going to hold up uh, against uh, this subpoena to investigate uh, criminal goings-on uh, that occurred in uh, Northern Ireland and the United Kingdom back in the 1970s and 80s, or is it not? Uh, the court decision that we have right now through the First Circuit Court of Appeals indicates that uh, their decision is it's not going to hold up. They take the position that when a uh, government agency issues a subpoena in a criminal investigation, that subpoena basically trumps about everything else that could stand in its way, absent some other evidentiary privilege. Uh, Boston College also sought to argue that um, in terms of uh, freedom of expression, the idea that you and I need to know exactly what's happening at all times, and the only way we can do that sometimes is to promise uh, people that we will keep what they say confidential, uh, that we'll lose a great deal of information as a society if uh, this case goes forward in the way it's being presented. Uh, right now, a stay has been granted by uh, the Supreme Court, and they're deciding whether to take the case. It'll be a monumental case because many oral history programs uh, do offer to restrict or seal interviews to try to get interviewees to be more forthright and candid. And this is happening all over the country. So we'll soon know whether they take it and then we'll find out how they rule on it. Let me uh, complete my remarks this morning with uh, a kind of look into the future, pull out my uh, crystal ball and see if I can offer you a few thoughts as to where I think oral history is going to be going forward in the next uh, 10 or 20 years. Uh, the digital revolution, which you are all part of, and I'm kind of on the edge, um, I think is going to continue. And I think over the next decade or so, just about uh, any program that can put its oral histories online will do so. And so the list of available oral histories online will be uh, growing prodigiously. Uh, the same revolution, I think, will result in more media productions utilizing oral histories. Uh, when I was teaching, I had students write family histories using oral history, and that was a concrete written paper. 
Today, I can imagine on both the high school and college level that it might result in a small media production. And that would be something that all of you with your technological ability can do uh, very uh, definitely. So oral history will fit into that. Uh, video history will largely supplant oral history because of technology. It'll be so much more easier to do the Carl Beck interview with the video and see his expressions and his demeanor than merely listen to an audio or read a transcript. Uh, also, projects like the Veterans History Project and the um, Story Corps, I think, will continue to grow and expand, and there will be others coming along as well. And finally, uh, because of the tremendous uh, reach of oral history, and because the fact that oral historians seem to be more and more intent on uh, interviewing people in a more contemporary vein, whether it's uh, post 9-11 or post Katrina or any other event, uh, I think there's the real possibility that uh, despite uh, being relatively sheltered from uh, legal difficulties up to this point, I, I think there'll be more, uh, more legal problems coming along and I guess there'll be more work for me in my role as a commentator on oral history and the law. So I thank you very much. Uh, have a good day. Again, thank you for being here. One thing I wanted to mention, uh, I didn't mention earlier, uh, among all the other things that John does is, is write, and he's written a number of books uh, on oral history. In fact, his most recent is something done by Oxford Press a couple years ago, a new edition of his Oral History and the Law. I also want to take this opportunity to introduce his lovely wife, Lucy, who has come with him for this event. We appreciate her being here. She's seated up here with my lovely wife, Connie. Uh, again, we appreciate them being here appreciate all the rest of you coming we hope that uh, the rest of the day goes well and you don't forget about oral history if you have a chance some of you have some very interesting connections family connections uh, hopefully you've learned something today that you can use in keeping your own family history alive again for the future as dr newen has said so again have a good day and thank you <laughs> <laughs>